don't touch that. I won't touch it. <laughs> so <clears throat> we were meeting with Professor Keene, who's a professor here at the um, architecture department in the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and he has several areas of interest, but we've come to him because he's known as somebody who spends a lot of time researching the prairie-style architecture in Frank Lloyd Wright. And we are... Just a little bit of background of why we're interviewing you. We are in a class with Professor Sen, who... Um, has given us a project and challenged us to find a story about a piece of architecture that might otherwise go unnoticed along the Milwaukee or along the Green Line um, bus route in Milwaukee. And our stop was the Hampton Avenue stop, and which is a mostly residential neighborhood. And we tried to look for architecture that stood out from the norm, and we come across a house on 4860 North Oakland Avenue that um, definitely broke the norm of the, the neighborhood, and it turned out that this house was um, designed and built by Russell Barr Williamson, and he was an architect, so we found that interesting, and and the story gets a little more interesting when we, when we discover that he was... Um, he was he worked with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright in the early part of the 19th century, and so that's why we've we've come to you. So, I guess our first question would be: um, Can you tell us a little bit about why Prairie Star architecture has found its way like into your interest and in, in your research? Uh, in the early 90s, a man named Marshall Erdman, who ran an engineering firm which still exists in Madison, one of the largest firms in the state. Uh, bequeathed a quarter million dollars to Sarah to study Frank Lloyd Wright because he had tried for years at Taliesin and wasn't fully impressed by the product he thought he'd go to the state school because he believed that uh, academia was marginalizing Wright. He wanted to bring it into more core curriculum. So with that money, we started the uh, Taliesin Habs project. We did lectures on it. We built a seminar class and a design studio on Frank Lloyd Wright. To try to integrate that language kind of back into mainstream academia because it's really not really part of too many architectural schools. Um, he passed away within a year or two, and the money then was spent at a smaller rate over about 20 years on smaller projects so that it would sort of have a longer lifespan. And now we've got uh, other funding that supplanted that to continue our project on Taliesin. So it's a tough sell because uh, Wright continues because of the power and legacy of the Bauhaus when it came to the United States with Walter Gropius, kind of became the dominant architectural tendencies in most schools of architecture. That eclipsed the, the primary school before that, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts from France, which gave us sort of the studio life here. So the merger of those two kind of kept Wright on the fringe of really impacting academia per se. So you'll hear about them in history class. There might be a periodic student that goes down the path, but it's by no means is it the, is it the core design language of any academic institution. And that was sort of one of Erdman's goal to get more of a public awareness for it. Okay. Um, and so, I mean, Wright has a long history, a long academic or a long career, and there are many people that have worked with them, but not not all of them will go down in the record books. And is Russell Barr Williamson a person that is known in the broader history of prairie style architecture and um, could you speak to his significance in the early development of prairie style architecture in the city of Milwaukee and the surrounding area? Yeah, unfortunately I would imagine that he's not even known within his hometown very well as an architect of record. Um, he worked in Wright's office and so there's a legacy of Wright's um, compatriots, the architects from his day that shared the prairie school with him. Then there's the legacy of the people that worked for Wright in Oak Park and the legacy of the people that worked for Wright through his apprenticeship at Taliesin. And these people would spawn off their own careers periodically, like Russell Barr Williamson did. So Williamson's uh, association with fame will be the times that he attempts to do really rigorous prairie homes, even though the bulk of his work is probably non-prairie architecture. It certainly is in probably the arts and crafts realm, but he worked within a variety of styles across the east side here and never really left the, the residential platform, the single-family residence. So it makes him an interesting architect, a very talented architect, but certainly not a high-profile architect. Okay. Um, 
during uh, Williamson's career, there were several significant events, um, World War One, the Depression, and uh, World War Two, and a lot of these seem to have impacted his uh, adapting his style, you know, whether starting with the prairie style and then branching out into different forms of architecture. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the evolution of his architectural style. Well, from, from my point of view, I think any architect, um, the horse does pull the cart. So the direction of your firm is really to where the work is going to be. Because if you're adamant toward your mission and goal and nobody's building it, you have to adapt. And even Wright knew that, that he had to be um, drawn into the modern movement to compete with other modernists. He had to adapt to a different type of clientele out there to build and be active as an architect. So with that in mind, Williamson adapted to many different styles beyond the prairie to be successful as a business as well. So, And yet, if you looked at the array of things he did on the east side here and looked at them all together in one uh, illustrative elevational view, you'll see there are a family of issues that are all well handed by a talented craftsman there, a very nice delineator. So working for Wright's practice, when Wright was abroad working on projects either across the United States or in other countries, Williamson was working on things back here at home, and so he learned a lot just from being sort of adjacent to Wright, even though Wright might have been in the office, to kind of run that information here for him. Sure. I mean, he worked for him for, you know, only two and a half, three years, and it seemed to has had a lasting impact over his entire architectural career, which I found to be pretty interesting. Yeah, and as you go back to the apprentices in Oak Park, like Walter Burley Griffin or Mary Mahoney Griffith, who actually married Walter Burley, or Schindler, um, there's lots of architects that went off and had internationally renowned careers coming out of a draftsmanship position of Wright's office. So that's just not coincidence that when you're working with a master of that skill set, even if he's not physically teaching and training you to adapt to that, you see it in the drawing, you see it in his intensity, and that builds people's characters in the profession. Okay. What, um, what would you consider to be one of Russell Barr Williamson's most significant pieces of architecture in the city of Milwaukee? Well, uh, he's got a property on Newbury Boulevard. Newbury Boulevard is a spectacle within... Milwaukee because it was planned by one of the greatest landscape architects, Fred McLaw Olmsted, where he connects Lake Park to the river. So Lake to River, River Park to Lake Park is connected by Newbury Boulevard. So with those three pieces, he gave the rest of the county sort of a footprint to how to design our park system, which is a gold standard nationwide where we're the best park system when we got the gold medal several years back. So he's built his largest piece, the Burst Residence, about midway through that uh, connection of great real estate in uh, east side Milwaukee. And what would be, if someone were to, as someone who's maybe not familiar with prairie-style architecture or, or Frank Lloyd Wright's design, what would be some physical attributes of a building that would, would scream, this is prairie-style architecture? Uh, well, first of all, if you back off on the word prairie, it is sort of a... Um, a misnomer because when Wright was codifying the prairie language, which he didn't really title, um, he wasn't really building in the prairie, he was building in a forest. The name of the two towns are Oak Park and River Forest, so he really didn't have a big view of the horizon line, which is the, the stretches of the prairie you associate with the Midwest. But if you just sort of look at a prototypical Midwestern site, farmland, and, and open prairies, then the horizon line is the most dominant architectural feature, flatlands. So with that in mind, then, the architecture that hugs that horizontal line through all of its detail, through its, its base footing into the soil, through its tiers of stacking of planes of space that hug around that central vertical hearth, reinforced by the detailing of, for instance, the mortar brickwork all the way to patterning of wood trim on the interiors. It's all horizontal banding, taken from a Japanese aesthetic that Wright saw as a youth uh, at the 1893 fair in Chicago when he saw the Japanese pavilion. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Sure. And <laughs> this is definitely, <laughs> this is take two. That's okay. <laughs> And yet, the bulk of your career is really going to be on 
the secondary or infill or tertiary stuff that's around the heroic stuff too. Sure. That our heavy lifting is the stuff that people aren't going to talk about, and it still has to be quality. And so if you walked into that home adjacent to his home proper, you'll be pleased by his attention to detail and his craft of moving form and mass around as well. Well, I found it interesting because, like like I said, I read that book last night, and it's not, it's, it's not a big book, but yeah. it's not a little book, but it was interesting enough to, like, I want to see how the story ends. Yeah. And, like, he started off at school as a, f- like, wanted to go to school for forestry. And I wondered, like, is there... Like, somehow there's a connection, because Wright seemed very connected to the land. Yeah. This this gentleman, Williamson, wanted to be a forester, took a took a sculpture class, and yeah. then ended up, like, wanting to be an artist. They steered him into architecture, thinking, you're not going to make money as an architect, yeah. or, or, or uh, as an artist. And that's, like, that's how, that's how his story went to architecture. Sure.